All right, I'll be reading from uh, the book by Eric Newman, the student of Carl Jung. The book is called The Origins and History of Consciousness. I think this is going to end up being a three-part series. This one is going to be about the hero, the archetype of the hero. And this is um, a Jungian psychology. Eric Newman was a, a prodigy uh, type, type uh, student of Jung and Jungian psychology. So it does get very deep, um, but there's some gems in here. So you might have to uh, listen twice or sit back and, and kind of ponder some of these, these concepts. But this is really the, uh, the structure of the mind, in, in my opinion. The structure of the psyche and uh, since we all are mind uh, it's, it's definitely good stuff to know so here we go the origin origins and history of consciousness Eric Newman the hero besides his paternal father there is a higher that is to say an archetypal father figure and similarly an archetypal mother figure appears beside the personal mother this double descent with its contrasted personal and suprapersonal parental figures, constellates the drama of the hero's life. An important part of the analysis of the dragon fight has already been set forth in Jung's psychological psychology of the unconscious. But the earthly form of which this work requires that the problem it broaches be corrected, supplemented, and systematized from the standpoint of the latter developments of analytical psychology. The ambiguity of the problem of the first parents, with its dual and even contradictory meanings, has brought confusion into our analytical procedure right down to the present day. The final laying of the ghost which, in the form of the Oedipus complex, haunts our Western minds, must be made the basis for any genuine understanding of the psychic phenomenon we are concerned with here. A little aside here, yeah, you can tell the language is, is you know, deep and, and heady and philosophical, but just let it sink in, it'll wash over you. These concepts are as rudimentary as they get when it comes to the psyche and the structure of the mind. And here what he's talking about is that all of us have set up the, the Oedipus complex. It's a natural human structure of the mind. It's the foundation of systems. It's a simple system w in which more complex systems arise over the course of our life. It's how the ego is formed and how we relate to our own selves. And it really has to do with our relationships in, um, in very early age as, a, uh, an, as an infant with our mother and our father. Um, and he says here that there's there's two mothers and two fathers. And what he's saying is there's your actual physical mother and father, which set up these neural pathways and these uh, they become the examples of what a woman should be and what a man should be to you. But there's also the masculine and feminine elements of all of the cosmos, of all of nature. So there's a masculine archetype standing with or next to your father and there's a feminine archetype with your mother and there's a little bit of contrast between the two because one is universal and natural it, it is nature the elements of nature and, and it contrasts with your actual parents and uh, because none of us are perfect so our actual parents at some point in our lives we have to um, meet them as equals uh, once we're, we're full-fledged adults and at some point we even uh, we even slay them um, metaphorically speaking uh, when we when we claim our own individuality when we become sovereign independent autonomous uh, beings and so um, those will be later chapters in this but right now that's what he's talking about continue on the phenomenon are fundamental so far as the future psychological development of Western man is concerned, and hence they also affect the ethical and religious development. As a Jeremias has pointed out and aptly proved that the essence of the mythological canon of the hero-redeemer 
is that he is fatherless and or motherless, that one of the parents is often divine, and that the hero's mother is frequently the mother goddess herself, or else be thrown to be a god. These mothers are virgin mothers, which is not to say that what psychoanalysis has attempted to read into this fact is necessarily correct. As everywhere in the ancient world, virginity simply means not belonging to any man personally. Virginity is the essence of sacred, not because it is a state of physical inviolatedness, but because it is a state of psychic openness to God. That's a key point. I think that's pretty fantastic to realize that the idea of virginity is not what we think it is. It's not that you've just been untouched. It has to do with your, your mind still being given and connected to, to God and not to another person. And in this case, you know, a man, a husband, or a, a suitor. We have seen that virginity was an essential aspect of the Great Mother, of her creative power, which is not dependent on any personal mate. But there's also a procreative masculine element here at work in her. At the Yoruboric level, this element is anonymous. Later it becomes subordinate to the Great Mother as phallic energy, and still later it appears by her side as her consort. Finally, the patriarchal world, she is dethroned by her prince consort and is herself subordinated, but always she retains her archetypal effectiveness. The hero's birth is expressively attributed to a virgin. The virgin is the leviathan, which the hero has to conquer. There are two aspects of the mother archetype. Beside the dark and terrible mother, there stands another, bright and beneficent. And just as the fearful dragon aspect of the great mother, the old woman of the West is an archetypal image of humanity eternal. So the friendly aspect, the bountiful immortality, beautiful virgin mother of the sun hero has its eternal archetype in the maid of the East. Regardless of the changeover from the matriarchy to patriarchy, the Kadeshoth, like all the virgin mothers, the heroes down to the Virgin Mary, are typical examples of identification with the female deity, Ashtaroth. For instance, who, in the embrace of the male, is willing to surrender only to something superpersonal, to the God, and nothing but the God. The peculiarity of feminine psychology that manifests itself here will have to be discussed in another place. In the present context, only its relation to the transpersonal is of importance. Consequently, beside the virgin mothers, there are other mothers for whom the men are mere ciphers, as Joseph was for Mary, or who only appear in the mortal fathers of a mortal twin. Whether the procreating deity appears as a monster or as the dove of a holy ghost, and whether Zeus is transmogrified into lightning, a golden shower, or an animal, is of no consequence. Always the important thing about the hero's birth is that it's extraordinary, superhuman, or non-human in nature, and proceeds from something extraordinary, superhuman, or non-human. In other words, he is believed to have been begotten by a daemon, or divinity. At the same time, the utter absorption of the mother in the experience of birth, and especially the birth of the hero, forms the essence of the myth. Her astonishment at having given birth to something extraordinary is only an intensification of the birth experience as such, an intensification in particular of the miracle that a female is able to produce a male out of herself. This miracle was, as we know, originally ascribed by primitive woman to the numinosum, to the wind, or to the ancestral spirits. It is a pre-patriarchal experience that antedates the time when procreation was felt to be causally connected with sexual intercourse and hence with a man. So I'm just going to pause real quick in, in that last line. You know, anthropologically speaking or even uh, evolutionary speaking, evolutionarily speaking, a, a lot of biology and evolutionary science would say that 
that the females hid the fact that when males have intercourse, that it leads to a baby. They hid that for, some say, thousands of years because before our minds were, were conscious, we were just instinctual animals. And so we were instinctively, males would instinctively have intercourse with females, but it would take 270 days before a baby was born. And so males didn't know that that action led to a newborn baby. And females, they say, sort of intuitively hid that from males um, to, to keep in control a certain amount of power because, well, things changed, but because females needed to be able to choose strong males to protect them and the child. And so they would often hide the fatherhood of the child from the father in case they needed or wanted a stronger male when the baby was born. So you can ponder that. Moving on. Woman's primary experience of the birth is matriarchal. It is not the man who is father to the child. The miracle of the procreation springs from God. Well, okay, so there we go. That's kind of what I was talking about. It'll probably go into this in a in a roundabout way. Thus, the matriarchal phase is ruled not by a personal father, but by a superpersonal progenitor of power. The creative energy of woman comes alive in the miracle of birth, by virtue of which she comes, the great mother and the earth goddess. At the same time, it is precisely at this deepest and most archaic level that the virgin mother and bride of God is a living reality. Brifault has shown that how possible is it to understand or how it is possible to understand the earthly history of mankind from a patriarchal standpoint. It is impossible, which is a late product of development, bringing with it the numerous revelations. According to the primordial images, which represent the mothers of heroes as virgins, be thrown to a deity embody essential elements of woman's pre-patriarchal experience. This early matriarchal stage can be recognized most easily in the modifications of the hero myth in its later patriarchal form. Whereas to begin with, the great mother was the only true creator, like Isis, who regenerates the dead Osiris. Later, she is impregnated by a superpersonal and divine progenitor. As we have seen, this god first appears in the old fertility ritual as the deified king, gradually strengthening his position until he finally comes to be the patriarch god king. The earliest matriarchal stage is to be found in Egypt at the Feast of Edfu, where to the accomplishments of orgies, the solemn consummation of the embrace of Horus, led to the immediate conception of the young Horus king. Here, begetter and begotten are still one, and as we found to be the case in the domain of the Great Mother, the figure of the Virgin Bride of God has an analogy in the Luxor festival, where the royal priestess of Hathor joins herself in an age-old pre-dynastic ritual to the sun god for the production of the divine sun. Later, in patriarchal times, this role was taken over by the king, representing the sun god. The double nature of god and king is clearly expressed in the words. They found her as she slept in the beauty of the palace. After the word they, Blackman, who's a, an author he quotes, Blackman adds, in parentheses, the combination of God and king. The double nature of the father is reproduced in the Horus son he begets, who is the son of his father, and yet the same son of the supreme God. The dual nature of the hero reappears in archetypal motif of the twin brothers, one mortal and the other immortal, the most obvious instance being the Greek myth of Dioscuri. I'll kind of do another aside here. You know, the twin brothers in the Bible of uh, Cain and Abel. Um, it doesn't really say one's mortal and one's immortal, but clearly um, Cain slays Abel. So there's that. The mortality comes up in that, that twin brother aspect because one lives and one dies. Their mother is the same night conceived the immortal son in the embrace of Zeus and the mortal son of the embrace of her husband 
Tyndarus. Again, Heracles was begotten by Zeus and his twin brother by Amphitryon. We are also told that the mother of Theseus was impregnated in the same night by Poseidon and by King Aegeus. There are countless other heroes who are the sons of mortal mothers and immortal gods, besides Heracles and the Dioscuri. We would only mention these examples, Perseus, Ion, and Romulus, Buddha, Karna, and Zoroaster. It is evident that in all these cases, the experience of the hero's dual nature, which became a factor of such extraordinary historical importance, no longer derives exclusively from woman's own experience of birth. In the first place, it is mankind itself, the collective, to whom the hero, just because he deviates from the human norm, appears as a hero and a divinely begotten being. Secondly, the idea of the hero's instinctively dual nature derives from his own experience of himself. He is a human being like others, mortal and collective like them, yet at the same time he feels himself a stranger to the community. He discovers within himself which, although it belongs to him, and it is, and as it were, a part of him, he can only describe a strange, unusual, godlike feeling. In the process of being exalted above the common level of his heroic capacity as a doer, a seer, a creator, he feels himself like one inspired, altogether extraordinary, and the son of God. Thus, through the difference, through his difference from others, the hero experiences his superpersonal progenitor as quite different from his personal earthly father, from whom he shares his corporal and collective nature. From this point of view, we can also understand the doubling of the mother figure, the feminine correlate of the hero's divine progenitor is no longer the personal mother, but likewise the superpersonal figure. The mother responsible for his existence as a hero is the virgin mother to whom God appeared. She too is a spiritual figure with transpersonal characteristics. She exists side by side with the personal mother who bore him in the body and, whether as an animal or nurse, suckled him. Thus, both the parental figures are, are there twice over for the hero, personally and transpersonally. Their confusion with one another and particularly the projection of the transpersonal images upon the personal parents is an abiding source of problems in childhood. The transpersonal archetype can appear in three forms as the bountiful and nourishing earth mother, as the virgin mother, whom the god impregnates, and as the guardian of the soul's treasure. In the myths, this ambiguity is often expressed as the conflict between nurse and princess. In the case of the father figure, the situation is more complicated, because an archetypal earth father seldom appears in patriarchal times. For reasons still to be examined, the personal father generally turns up as an obstructive figure alongside the divine progenitor. The virgin mother, however, who gives birth to the hero after being impregnated by God, is a spiritual feminine figure who opens herself to heaven. She has many forms, ranging from the innocent virgin, who is overwhelmed by the heavenly messenger, and the young girl who receives the God in an ecstasy of longing, to the sorrowful figure of Sophia, who gives birth to the divine son, the Logos, knowing that he is sent by God and that the hero fate is its suffering. The birth of the hero and his fight with the dragon only became intelligible in the significance of masculinity. As it has been understood, only with the hero myth does the ego really come into its own as the bearer of masculinity. And for this reason, must make it clear that the symbolic nature of, of this masculinity, such a clarification is essential if we are to distinguish the masculine from the paternal, which is all the more necessary because the errors of psychoanalysis, with its false interpretation of the so-called Oedipus complex and the totem mythology derived therefrom, have caused the great confusion. The awakening ego experiences its masculinity, example, in its increasing active self-consciousness, as good and bad at once. It is thrust out from the maternal matrix, and it finds itself by distinguishing itself from this matrix. In the sociological sense, too, 
The male, once he grows up and becomes independent, is thrust out from the matrix to the degree that the experiences he has accentuate his own differences and singularity. It is one of the fundamental experiences of the male that sooner or later he must experience the matrix with which he originally lived in participation mystique as the you, in quotes, the non-ego, something different and strange. Here, as everywhere in the fundamental survey of consciousness develops, we must shake off the prejudice of the patriarchal family situation. The original situation of the human group is pre-patriarchal, if we wish to avoid somewhat the dubious term matriarchal. Okay, I know very few people are going to really get this, understand this, but it's funny. In current times, there's all this talk of the patriarchy, but there's there's just so much evolutionary history that uh, that was matriarchal, where the females really dictated more of the way in which society ran, um, not because they, they logically thought it through, but based on survival based on, you know, caring for offspring and the, the necess necessity of find, finding food for them, nursing them, keeping them alive, keeping them warm. Um, the, the society revolved around mother and child. Uh, so the patriarchy is, according to Newman, is a relatively new social structure. I don't know how new. I mean, who knows, maybe, you know, 100,000 years or something like that. But it should be known that the matrix um, has a long history within the social structure of human families. Even among animals, we freely find that the young generation of males is driven off and that the mother stays with the young females. The original matriarchal family group of mothers and children presupposes from the start that the young male will have a strong propensity to roam. Even if he stays within the matriarchal group, he will associate with other males to form a hunter and fighter group, which is coordinated with the feminine center of the matriarchy. This masculine group is necessary, mobile, and enterprising. Moreover, in the situation of constant danger in which it finds itself, it has an added inducement to develop its consciousness. Here, already, perhaps, it is fostered that the contrast between psychology of male groups and matriarchal psychology of the female. The matriarchal group with its mass emotionality between mothers and children, its stronger local ties, and its greater inertia is to a large extent bound to nature and instincts. Menstruation, pregnancy, and lactation periods activate the instinctual side and strengthen woman's vegetative nature as the psychology of modern woman still shows. In addition, there is the powerful earth tie, which arises with the development of gardening and agriculture by women, and the dependence of these arts upon the natural myth. The strengthening of participation mystique as a consequence of the matriarchal group living all huddled together in caves, houses, and villages also plays its part. All these factors reinforce the submergence in the unconscious, which is a characteristic feature of the female group. The male group, on the other hand, given to roaming, hunting, and making war, is a nomadic fighter group long before the domestication of animals produced the roving bands of cattlemen, even when the group is domiciled about a matriarchal family nucleus. The matriarchal system of exogamy, and exogamy, I believe, just means like to be cast out or to be put out. Let me repeat that. The matriarchal system of exogamy hinders the formation of male groups because the men are obliged to marry outside their tribe and thus get dispersed having to live matriarchally as strangers in the wife's tribe the man is an alien in the clan in which he has married but as a member of his own clan he is alienated from his place of residence that is to say when as was originally always the case, he lives matrilocally in his wife's place of residence. He is a tolerated stranger, but in his native place of residence, 
where his rights are still valid, he lives only occasionally. The autonomy of the female group is, as Brefault has shown, strengthened by its institution. Since the line runs from grandmother, grandmother to mother and from mother to, to daughter, while the formation of male groups is broken down, what Proust says is therefore true of the male group, particularly of the nuclear group, in the community is a matriarchal continuum of mothers, women, and children. This is probably one of the reasons why men's societies came into being. In the course of the time of the male group steadily gains its strength, and political, military, and economic considerations eventually lead to organized male groups in the nascent city and state. Within these groups, the cultivation of friendships is more important than rivalry, and more stress is laid on male similarity and, and on dissimilarity from the female than on mutual jealousies. The youth group made of young men who are all contemporaries is the place where the male really discovers himself for the first time. When he feels himself a stranger among women and at home among men, when we have the sociological situation that corresponds to the self-discovery of ego consciousness. But masculine, as we have said, is in no way identical with father, least of all with the personal father figure, which cannot be supposed to have been very effective in the pre-patriarchal family. The old woman, the mothers-in-law, and the mothers stand at the head of the female group, and as with many animals, the self-contained unit is formed to which everything belongs, including, including the boys up to a certain age. Exogamous admission to this group by emphasizing the alien character of the male exposes him to the influence of the evil mother-in-law, who is always the object of a powerful taboo, but to the influence of any masculine authority. Yep, kind of just going on to, to show how, how much... Uh, the social structures in history have been really dominated by women. In its original form as a system of alliances among members of different age groups, the male group was organized on a strictly hierarchical basis. The rights that induct a man from one age group to another were accordingly rights of initiation. Everywhere these men's societies are of the greatest importance, not only for the development of masculinity, and of man's consciousness of himself, but for the development of culture as a whole. This horizontal organization of age groups obviates personal conflict in the sense of a hostile father-son relationship because the terms father and son connote group characteristics and not personal relationships. The older men are fathers and the young men sons, and the collective group's solidarity is paramount. Conflicts, so far as they exist at all, are between the age groups and have a collective and archetypical rather than a personal and individual character. The initiations enable the young men to rise up in the scale to perform various functions within the group. The trials of endurance are tests of the virility and stability of the ego. They are not to be taken personalistically as the vengeance of the old upon the young. Any more than our matriculation is the vengeance of the old men upon rising generations but merely a certificate of maturity for entry into the collective. In almost all cases, age brings an increase in power and importance based on increased knowledge gained through successive initiations so that old men have little cause for resentment. That's kind of an important part. They're basically saying that, that the job of, of, of fathers to sons is, is to initiate them into being you know, mature and responsible uh, with their manhood or their masculinity. So when there are challenges or initiations or tests, they're not personal. They're not like trying to pick on young men. Um, they're trying to, um, you know, really groom and teach young men into being mature so that uh, when the old ones die, that there'll be a new generation just coming up behind them that they feel are strong enough to and responsible enough to continue on. The, um, the culture's values. Male societies, secret societies, and friendly societies originate in matriarchal, matriarchal conditions. They are the natural complement to the supremacy of the matriarchy. The self-experience of the ego, recognizing its 
specific affinity with the world of men and its distinction from the feminine matrix marks a decisive stage in the development and is the precondition of the dependence, the initiation into the men's house, where the ego becomes conscious of itself, is a mystery, vouch, vouchsafing a secret knowledge that always gravitates around the higher masculinity. The higher masculinity here in point has no phallic or chthonic accent. Has no phallic or chthonic accent. Its content is not, as in many initiations of young girls, sexuality, but its counterpole, its spirit, which appears together with light, the sun, the head, and the eye as symbols of consciousness. The spirit is what is accentuated and into the initiations led. Even today, we almost find in cases of male homosexuality a matriarchal psychology where the great mother is unconsciously in the ascendant. That's interesting, but it makes perfect sense. It also said, he also says that the initiations really don't have anything to do with sexuality, whereas uh, a lot of female initiations do because it's such, it is the primary role of, of the female to be able to, um, you know, carry and create new life. So a lot of the female initiations tend to revolve around um, around sexuality, and the male initiations don't. The men are ranked with the fathers, with the elders, who are the bulwark of law and order, and hence with a world system which we may call symbolically heaven, because it stands at the opposite pole of the female, female feminine earth. The system embraces the whole sacrosanct and magical world order, down to the law and reality of the state. Heaven is, in this sense, not the abode of a deity or a celestial locality. It is simply denotes the spiritual noumena, the spiritual pneuma principle, which in masculine cultures gives birth not only to the patriarchal God, but to scientific philosophy as well. We use the symbolic expression of heaven in order to characterize this complex realm in its entirety before it became differentiated. Using for this purpose a comprehensive term in keeping with the mythological symbolism of early times, it is immaterial whether this heaven is an indeterminate mass of powers or is animated by definite figures, spirits, ancestors, totem, animals, gods, etc. All these are representatives of the masculine spirit and the world of men, and they communicate themselves with or without violence to the neophyte on his expulsion from the material world, from the maternal world. In the initiation rites, therefore, the young men are, as it were, swallowed up by the tutelary spirit of the masculine world and are reborn as children of the spirit rather than of the mother. They are sons of heaven, not just sons of earth. This spiritual rebirth signifies the birth of a higher man, who, even on, prim on a primitive level, is associated with consciousness, the ego, and willpower. Hence, the fundamental correlation between heaven and masculinity. Therein lies the higher activity of conscious action, conscious knowledge, and conscious creation as a distinct from the blind drive of unconscious forces, and precisely because the male group, in accordance not only with its nature, but also with its sociological and psychological trends, requires the individual to act independently as a responsible ego. Initiation into the men's society is always bound up with the testing and strengthening of consciousness, with what mythologically speaking one might call generation of the higher masculinity. Fire and other symbols of wakefulness and alertness play an important part of the rites of initiation, where the young men have to watch and wake, learn to overcome the body and the inertia of the unconscious by fighting against tiredness. Keeping awake and the endurance of fear, hunger, and pain go together as an essential element in fortifying the ego and schooling the will. Also, instruction and initiation into the traditional lore are as much a part of the rites as the proofs of willpower that have to be given. 
The criterion of manliness is an undaunted will. The ready ability to defend the ego and consciousness should need, ar should need arise and to masters one unconscious impulses and childish fears. Even today, the initiation rites of puberty still have the character of an initiation into the secret world of the masculine spirit. Whether the spirit lies hidden in the stock of ancestral myths, in the law and ordinances of the collective, or in the sacraments of religion, all is all one. They are all expressions differing in rank and degree of the same masculine spirit, which the specific property of the male group this is. This is the reason why women are forbidden on pain of death to be present at the initiations and why they were originally excluded from the places of worship in all religions. The man's world representing heaven stands for law and tradition for the gods of aforetime, so far as they were masculine gods. It is no accident that all the human culture and not Western civilization alone is masculine in character from Greece and the Judeo-Christian sphere of culture to Islam and India. Although women's share in this culture is invisible and largely unconscious, we should not underestimate its significance and scope. Masculine trend, however, is towards greater and coordination of spirit, ego, consciousness, and will because man discovers his true self in consciousness and is a stranger to himself in the unconscious, which he must inevitably experience as feminine. The development of the masculine culture means development of consciousness. Historically speaking, it seems to us that the phenomenon of totemism is of great importance for the development of heaven and the spirit of world of man. For this phenomenon, even though it originates in the matriarchal epoch, is significantly masculine in spirit. Identification with the procreative spiritual principle is an extraordinarily important factor in the lives of primitives. Here, too, Freud made a vital discovery through he distorted and misunderstood something even more vital. The totem is indeed partly a father, but it never has a personal character, let alone that of a personal father. On the contrary, the whole point of the ritual is that the procreative spirit should be experienced as something remote and different, and yet as belonging. That is why the totem is very often an animal, but it can also be a plant or even a thing. Although the soul is a, of the primitive is much closer to things than we are, he can only establish identity with them by means of magical rites. His ritual induction into the spirit world of the ancestral totem with the aid of the transforming mask indicates that the transpersonal numinosum. The transforming mask indicates that the transpersonal numinosum ought to be experienced as the source from which he as an initiate derives his being. That is the meaning of all rituals where the purely personal has to be transcended. The initiations of puberty, like all initiations, aim at producing something superpersonal, namely that the part of the individual which is transpersonal and collective. Hence, the production of this part is a second birth, a new generation through the masculine spirit, and is accompanied by the inculcation of secret doctrines and ancestral knowledge and cosmic lore in order to sever all ties with the purely familiar existence of the immature. The male group is the birthplace, not only of consciousness and of the higher masculinity, but of individuality and the hero. A little aside here. It's often said in sociological, I actually say psychological terms, that females are more social. They have developed a higher social communication than males. They actually speak more words per day than males do. It's also said that because of this social development of their psyches, um, they tend to be more collective. They tend to, um, to follow fashions with each other, you know, and they don't necessarily know why. Um, they tend to, tend to be less individualistic. And um, I think that 
there's a balance obviously between the male and the female, but I think that this is why you kind of see many of the great leaders of, of industry. And when I say industry, I mean anything, arts, sciences, um, you know, human um, civic endeavors are really almost, I'd say, I don't know, they're, you know, heavily dominated by, by men. Um, and I think this has to do with not, not the female ability to do or not to do it, but that um, they tend to be less individualistic. And it takes uh, like this individualistic and innovative and um, sort of willing to be um, outside of society, willing to risk. Um, it, takes, it takes a certain kind of mindset to be willing to be cast out if you fail that um, more men tend to have. Okay, going on. We have referred more than once to the connections of centroversion with the development of the ego. The tendency towards wholeness, which centroversion represents, functions quite unconsciously in the earliest phase, but in formative phases it manifests itself in group tendency. This group wholeness is no longer entirely unconscious. It is experienced through projection upon the totem. The totem is an indefinable quantity to which the various parts of the group stand in participatory relationship. In other words, they are unconsciously identical with it. On the other hand, there exists also a link running back over generations. The totem is an ancestor, but more in the sense of a spiritual founder than a progenitor. Primarily, he is a numinosum, a transpersonal spiritual being. He is transpersonal because although an animal, a plant, or whatever else, he is such not an individual entity, not a person, but as an idea, a species. That is to say, on the primitive level, he is a spirit that has mana, works magic, and is taboo, but must be approached with considerable ceremony. This totemic being forms the basis of a whole, a totem community with which a totem community which is not so much a natural biological unit as a spiritual psychic structure. It is already an association of or a brotherhood in the modern sense, that is, a sort of spiritual collective. The totem and the social order depending from it are totally different from the matriarchal group which is true biological unit, whereas these are founded and have come into being through a spiritual act. We know that among the North American Indians, but not am among them alone, the essential content of initiation is the acquisition of an individual guardian spirit. This spirit, who may be lodged in an animal or a thing, introduces into the life of the initiate who experiences him a whole sequence of ritual obligations and observances, and plays a decisive role among all humans and all shamans, priests, and prophetic figures in primitive societies and throughout a classical world. This universal phenomenon is the expression of a personal revelation of God, which can occur at all levels and take any number of forms. The growth of totem, totemism is to be regarded as a missionary religion of a primitive kind for which we may suppose that the individual who has been granted the vision of a spirit in the initiation rites will form a group with others of like mind whom he draws with him into communion with the spirit. This mode of group formation can be seen at work to this day in the founding of sects and the initiation ceremonies of primitives, the mystery religions of the ancient world, and the great institution institutional religions all arise in the same way. In totemism, in the early form of institutional religion, the founder is the priest prophet. He enjoys primary intercourse with his individual spirit and hands on its cult. As the myths tell us over and over again, he is the hero in the annals of his totem and the spiritual ancestor. He and the totem belong together and this particularly true from the standpoint of the community which later groups itself round them. 
the hero and founder as the personal experiencing ego and the totem experienced by him as a spiritual being belong together not only in the psychological sense in which the spiritual self appears in some form to the ego but for the community also these two figures always coincide thus moses for example acquires the features of jehovah and the god of love is worshiped in the figure of christ the sacred formula i and the father are one always subsists psychologically between the ego and the transpersonal manifestation it experiences whether this manifestation takes the form of an animal a spirit or a father figure hence the spirit totem and the ancestor to whom it first appeared often merge in the figure of the spiritual founding father where the word founding is to be taken literally as the denoting a spirit creator or originator that is the founding it's inspirational that is the founding is inspirational and can be seen from the description of an analysis every initiation rite and every totemistic ceremony the spiritual collective as we find it in all initiations in all secret societies sects mysteries and religions is essentially masculine and despite its communal character essentially individual in the sense that each man is initiation is initiated as an individual and undergoes a unique experience that stamps his individuality the individual ascent and the elect character of the group stand in marked contrast to the matriarchal group where the archetype of the great mother and the corresponding stage of consciousness are dominant the opposed group of male societies and secret organizations is dominated by the archetype of the hero and by the dragon fight mythology which represents the next stage of conscious development the male collective is the source of all the taboos laws and institutions that are destined to break and be dominant of the ouroboros and the great mother heaven the father and the spirit go hand in hand with masculinity and represent the victory of the patriarchy over the matriarchy this is not to say that the matriarchy knows no law but the law by which it is informed is the law of instinct unconscious natural functioning and this law subserves the propagation preservation and evolution of the species rather than the development of a single individual as the masculine ego consciousness increases in strength the biological weaknesses of the female group of pregnant or nursing mothers or children etc tends to heighten the power of consciousness in the protective fighter group the situation of the males fortifies the egos and consciousnesses just as that of females fortifies the instinct of the group hunting and war are conducive to the development of an individual ego capable of acting and responsibly in a dangerous situation and equally conducive to the development of the leader principle whether the leader is chosen to cope with a given situation say for the specific purpose of a canoe building or for a hunting expedition or to act as a permanent leader the situation of leader and led is bound to arise sooner or later in the male group even when this is still coordinate with the matriarchal nucleus that's just kind of going on again to say that in a, in a great you know in the material world like civilization is generally speaking built by the hands of men I mean, um, a lot of women don't want to hear this um, and it doesn't mean he's saying it doesn't mean that they don't have a, an equal role it's just that their role is, is a different one it's more about the group and less about um, creating um, an individual ego or an individual consciousness it's more about the collective um, and it's instinctual and intuitive to keep the collective moving forward um, but they do have different roles and it seems to be that uh, their their tasks are, are developing their bodies and minds in specific ways and the, the male tasks um, that create leadership tend to be you know around some sort of test or some sort of initiation like a hunt or some sort of task that you you have to prove that you can complete at least well enough to, to gain the respect of your male peers
and then hopefully develop that skill uh, into mastery at some point if you want to be, you know, considered the the great wise, you know, father of, of the group, the tribe. With the emergence and stabilization of leadership, the group becomes further individualized. Not only in the leader set up as a hero, but the figures of spiritual progenitor, creator god, ancestor, ideal leader, etc. begin to crystallize out from the mistiness of the primitive totem image. It is a characteristic of the god in the background, a very early figure in the history of religion, that he is regarded not as a forefather, but more the father who is the author of all things. He is a spiritual figure not primarily connected with nature. He belongs to the primordial age, to the dawn of history, and steps out of it to bring culture and salvation to mankind. He is timeless in the sense that he does not enter into time, but dwells in the background of time, in the primordial time that regulates our earthly chronology. Characteristic, too, is he is his relation to the history and morality. For the tribal ancestor, he is directly related to the medicine men, to the elders, the representatives of authority, to power, wisdom, and esoteric knowledge. This creator figure is a numinous projection from whom derived the god-king figure of the hero. Generally speaking, the hero appears as the son of God, and he is not the god himself. The creator god, as a figure identical with the mythological heaven, namely the masculine spirit, spiritual supreme Euroboric background through heavenly, is not to be taken as identical with a heavenly god. The fusion of the ancestor with the creator god and the culture hero is due to the process of personalization, which gives form to the unformed. Not until the hero identifies himself with what we have called the masculine heaven can he enter upon the on his fight with the dragon the identification culminates in the feeling that he is the son of god embodying in himself the whole mightiness of heaven this is as much to say that all heroes are god begotten heavenly succor the feeling of being rooted up aloft in the father divinity who is not just head of the family but a creative spirit alone makes possible the fight with the dragon of the great mother representing and upholding the spiritual world in the face of the dragon the hero becomes the liberator and savior the innovator and bringer of wisdom and culture jung carl jung that is has demonstrated that the hero's incest implements his rebirth that only as one twice born is he the hero and that, conversely, anyone who has suffered the double birth must be regarded as a hero. It is not only among primitives that rebirth is the sole object of initiation rites. As one initiated into the mysteries, every Gnostic, every Indian Brahmin, and every baptized Christian is a man reborn for the submitting of heroic incest and entering into the devouring maw of the unconscious, the ego is changed in its essential nature and is reborn another. The transformation of the hero through the dragon fight is a transfiguration, a glorification, indeed an apotheosis, the central feature of which is the birth of a higher mode of personality. The qualitative and essential change is what distinguishes the hero from the normal person. As we have said, mytho mythology represents the hero as having two fathers, a personal father who does not count or is the father of the carnal lower man, of the mortal part, and the heavenly father who is the father of the heroic part of the higher man who is extraordinary and immortal. Hence, the archetype of the hero myth is often a sun myth or even a moon myth. Glorification means deification. The hero is the sun or moon, is divine. As mere mortal, he is in reality the son of a purely personal father. But the hero, he, is the son of a god and is identified or identifies himself with him. Perhaps the earliest historical example of this is to be found once again in the Egyptian pharaoh. The kings of Egypt were on their father's sides, sons of Horus and heirs of Osiris, 
and as the kingship developed, they were identified not only with Osiris the moon, but with Ra the sun. The king styled himself the god Horus. People spoke of him as God. And this is not as Aramid thinks, a fine phrase merely, but a symbolic fact which degenerated into the phrase only in modern times with the divine right of kings. Well, a little quick aside here. Most people don't know this and may surely disagree, but I don't think Egypt was the, the first place in which um, this pharaonic idea happened. I actually think that Egypt got it from Atlantis. And Atlantis was actually a real place, which is now, I believe it's in northern Europe, really around Finland. Um, that's a whole other topic. But the mythology of Odin, or Udin, Udin Ma, is an archetype that uh, is older than Egyptian. And it's the same story. You know, Odin is the all-father. Um, he was a man who, again, was, was re reborn, crucified, and then reborn, uh, only to bring back wisdom and writing to his people.